Hey guys, stay tuned to the end of the episode where I'm going to read one of the iTunes reviews for Fascination Street Podcast. If you've left one, it might be yours. And if you haven't, do it and maybe it will be in the future. I believe that everybody has a story and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back Streetwalkers. Last year, I had the wonderful opportunity to interview director Paul Feig about his film, A Simple Favor, right before it was released in theaters. I had the wonderful opportunity to interview Paul Feig again, but this time we are talking about his newest film, Last Christmas, which is in theaters right now. It stars Amelia Clark, you know, the mother of dragons. It stars Henry Golding from A Simple Favor and Crazy Rich Asians. And it stars Emma Thompson who co-wrote this film as well as starred in it. In this episode, we talk about what Paul's been up to since we last spoke. Of course, we talk about Last Christmas in theaters right now. We talk about some fun stuff that happened on the set of this film in London. We do a little bit of a deep dive into the soundtrack. This film's title is Last Christmas, which is a George Michael song. And so George Michael and his music play a very integral role in this film. We talk about how that sort of worked out and how easy it was or wasn't to get permission from the estate. And since he is an ordained internet minister, a man of the digital cloth, as he says, I ask him to do me a little favor. Plus, we talk about a really cool gift that he gave to an amazing actor and why. So enjoy, folks. This is my second conversation with the director of Last Christmas, Paul Feig. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Paul Feig. Welcome back. How you doing, man? Steve, I am great. It's good to talk to you again. Uh, 100% my pleasure. It's been a while. It has been a while. Uh, just over a year, I think. The last time was um, right before uh, Simple Favor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which, by the way, I haven't spoke to you since then, but I absolutely love that movie. Oh, thanks, dude. I saw it by myself. And then I took my wife to see it, and then I took my daughter to see it. I, I love that movie. It was so, and and then I bought the album, the uh, the vinyl. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, thanks for all the support on that. I truly appreciate that. Absolutely. Now, as far as that soundtrack goes, did you have anything to do with putting that music together? Oh, yeah. That's all my job as a director. We Anything you hear, anything you see is all stuff that we've, we've, we've come up with or approved or, or all that. No, I, I was when I was writing that movie or doing working on the rewrite of it. My wife and I have been listening to a lot of uh, 60s French pop at that time. We were just kind of obsessed with it. And as I was writing and doing these rewrites, I was just going like, this is kind of the sound of this movie because it kind of fits with this woman who, you know, Blake's character doesn't even want to kind of be in this neighborhood she's in. She wishes she was somewhere else. And so I love the idea that she kind of wished she was in Paris. And so she brings that along with her. And, and you know, I just like to have a uni unifying sound when I have a movie. You know, I mean, this new one I just did has all George Michael tracks in it. But, you know, you, you need some, I always feel you need some kind of musical unity to just kind of, I don't know, to frame the whole film, really. Oh, I, I 100% agree. And uh, just real quick, one more thing about A Simple Favor. Uh, I thought it was hilarious as I was watching it that every time anybody was drinking anything, it was aviation gin. <laughs> <laughs> that really made me laugh because uh, obviously for those who don't know uh ryan reynolds is a co-owner of that company and he's married to blake lively so that was really really funny to me so so well done <laughs> yeah no it's funny it was very it was kind of weirdly unintentional just because uh we were trying to figure you know we wanted to have a gin on the set and they kind of had these fake bottles you know from the prop department i was like well, let's have a real one and so i was actually going to call 
Hendrix because I, I, I'm a big Hendrix drinker. And um, Blake was like, oh, you know, actually Ryan has this this gin that he really likes, and you know, and, and we know the company and all that, and you know, and then she showed me the bottle. I was like, oh, that's a cool bottle. Let's put it in. <laughs> I did, but I didn't know at the time he had actually bought the company. <laughs> Oh, that's so, so funny. <laughs> so, but God bless, God bless Blake. She's hilarious when she, you know, <laughs> pulled something like that off. But, you know, it's such a good looking bottle. And, and, you know, I really do like Oh, that. it's a gorgeous bottle. Absolutely. Yeah. And so with that in mind, uh, you know, I don't know what your next film is going to be, but if there is a podcasting uh, part of it, go, you feel free to, to use Fascination Street Podcast. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. There you done, done. <laughs> All right, Paul. So you have a movie that's in theaters right now. It's called Last Christmas. Mm -hmm. And of course, the title says it all. It is a Christmas movie. And so I guess my first question is, uh, why did you open a Christmas movie in the first week of November? Uh, cause if you open it the week before December, you have one week to make money off of it. You want to, you know, you want to have it in theaters long enough for people to, to be able to see it and to, you know, cause once Christmas is over, then, then the movie's gone. So, you know, nobody wants to see a Christmas movie after Christmas, especially after New Year's. So, um, you know, uh, maybe it, it was open a little too early, but also the competition in these last two months is so, so heavy, you know, with Frozen 2 coming out and all the Oscar contenders and all that, that you just, you know, dating a movie is very, very challenging, you know, and this just felt like it gave us gave us a, a few weeks without the crazy heavy competition from big the big juggernauts, you know, Star Wars and all that kind of thing. And, um, you know, you just hope it stays around in, in theaters uh, until Christmas and that the theater owners will, will keep it in there and not, you know, and take it out. But, um you know, it's it's a uh, it's a calculated risk. Well, that makes sense. Open early and give it more, you know, longer legs or whatever. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, and as as far as theater owners keeping it in the theater, I think you're off to a great start. I believe you opened uh, number one in the UK, right? Yeah, last weekend. Yeah, we were number one. In all through the UK, which is really nice because the movie's you know such a love letter to London. Anyway, it was all shot in London, and all we did all our posts there. Um, so it's it's a real London story. But you know, I saw when I put it together, wanted to make sure it, it worked domestically and internationally and and everywhere. And you know, this is a very sweet sweet movie, the kind of movie I think we need right now in our very divisive time. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> My wife and I saw it opening weekend. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank. You. And we absolutely loved it. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate and, it. And every time I, every, you know, you always fast forward through commercials when you're watching something. Every yeah. time a commercial for Last Christmas comes on, I make I make her watch it. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the only commercial we watch right now. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you. I'm happy to I'm happy to make the cut. <laughs> oh, it's it's so great. I love it. So you 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 did film it in London, the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, all in London. Uh... Pretty much, uh, we started the first week of December, so just about a year ago, we started shooting it. I wanted to shoot before Christmas, at least for a few weeks, so we could get all the real Christmas lights and decorations of London. So we kind of jammed to shoot uh, the first three weeks and did a lot of, um, you know, that's where we did all the Covent Garden and Regent Street and Piccadilly Circus and uh, the Strand and the Embankment and all that, just to, to get all those natural Christmas lights because... You know, you just we just couldn't That's make them. That's set decoration. Yeah, I mean, we could, and also we just couldn't make them as big as as they are. I mean, Regent Street is just so gorgeous. I mean, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they're talking before she gets on the bus after their first date, and um, you know, just having you know, just miles of Christmas lights up and down this famous famous street and having those on camera, you know, being the real thing. That was really exciting and, and beautiful. It's so, so pretty. How long? So you filmed it in London. How long did you film? Uh, we shot from the beginning of December all the way through middle of February. So about two and a half months. It was it's not a bad size shoot. I think like 45 days, which is right around the standard, maybe a little lower end of kind of a studio standard. All my movies tend to shoot in the 50 to 55 day range, unless it's a big one like like Ghostbusters. And then that goes for 70 plus days. Gotcha. Okay. So, so you're in London for two and a half months or whatever. How come you don't have a British accent? <laughs> How weird would I be if I suddenly had a British accent? <laughs> you would think I was insane. <laughs> 
Well, I don't think Madonna was in London two and a half months. Well, exactly. See, that's the thing. I, I, it's funny. My my I have a friend of mine. I remember him saying uh, his dad was complaining about a friend of theirs when he was a kid. And he was like, "Yeah, I hate when I hate when people come back from vacation in England and they have an English accent." I remember thinking, like, how insane would you have to be <laughs> to do that? <laughs> I mean, even if you lived there for years, like to suddenly suddenly get this English. Hey, hello, how are you? It, 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 it's so <laughs> hilarious i mean people that do that it, it's i don't quite understand it it's not like it's not like an accent is a is a uh, is a virus or anything. I don't think you can catch it. <laughs> arnold schwarzenegger surely hasn't well no exactly that's exactly it i mean there's plenty of times you wish you had an english accent when you're there because you just hate being kind of you know like oh you're the american like anytime you do something that they think is weird it's like oh you're an american it's like all oh, right yes i'm an american <laughs> yes yes i called it i called it the, the the restroom instead of the loo they 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 particularly hate when you when you call it the, the restroom they think that's hilarious <laughs> so uh, you know but then they call it the toilet which are like well that's kind of gross <laughs> so i think i'd rather call it the that is kind of gross <laughs> exactly <laughs> we'll settle on loo the Lou. That's so weird, especially if your name is Lou. Yeah, see, exactly. <laughs> Point me to Lou. <laughs> so I took my wife to see last Christmas opening weekend, and we loved it. And it is a Christmas love story on the surface, but the deeper underlying themes deal with love and loss, being loved and being lost, losing a part of yourself, and the journey to find it again is how my wife and I would describe it. How would you describe this film? No spoilers. I mean, that's a really, really good description, I have to say, because it is so much about this character of Kate, played by the amazing Amelia Clark, and, and just how, you know, when we meet her, she is, she's a mess, and she's really, you know, going through issues that we later slowly find out has to do with this health thing she went through, and the fact that she doesn't feel complete and then how you kind of lash out at yourself and how you lash out at the people around you, you know, and, and how she just has to kind of be brought back into reality or just back to the normal world by both, you know, meeting up with the character of Henry, of Tom, who's Henry Golding, and also just being forced to kind of go back to her family and to, to see them as the, the humans, the vulnerable humans that they are just like herself. Um, you know, though when I read this script, you know, the Nemer wrote that she sent to me when she first wrote it, that's what I really loved about it. I just thought, you know, it's such a kind of a redemption story and which is, you know, which is really perfect for, for being a Christmas movie. Just so everybody knows um, when Paul said, that Emma wrote. Uh, Emma Thompson is one of the stars, and she also co-wrote the film with her husband, or, I believe, right? Co-wrote the screenplay with her husband? They wrote the story together, she and Greg Wise, and then uh, Emma wrote it with um, Bryony e. Kimmings, who's an amazing playwright. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, the last time we spoke, we were talking about A Simple Favor, and Henry Golding was in that as well. And at the time, that was before... Obviously, before Simple Favor came out and before Crazy Rich Asians came out. And I remember at the time you telling me that this guy is going to be a big star. Now, <laughs> I saw both of those other movies, uh, Crazy Rich Asians and obviously Simple Favor. And mm -hmm. I agree he is going to be a big star. He's already a big star. But I had no idea that you were single handedly going to make him a big star by putting him in all your movies. <laughs> well, credit has to go first and foremost to John Chu, who who you know who discovered Henry for Crazy Rich Asians, and you know, and really took a chance on on a guy who had never acted before. You know, I mean, Henry was um, well, he started as a hairdresser uh, in in London uh, in a very fancy place on Sloane Square, which is a fancy neighborhood, and then he. Um, wanted to get into presenting so actually went back to indonesia and um and hosted in singapore and, and hosted a um a travel show for the bbc there and that's what both john chu and then myself saw was was this sizzle reel that he had done of him hosting the show and you're just like oh god this guy's so funny and fun and gorgeous on camera and confident and, and, and you know he just he had that charisma that you you know just couldn't deny and so you know for a simple favor I, I was trying to just figure out who to cast for that role and my wife who was a big fan of the crazy rich asian books she hadn't even you know hadn't seen it because they had only just finished shooting it said you should look into that cast and so i you know i saw his name and looked up that material on him and it was like wow this guy's great then i called john chu 
and just said, you know, is, is, how was your experience? Is he like the real deal? And John's like, yes, he totally is. He's completely directable. He's so wonderful and he's super talented, but he's, you know, lovely to work with. And I'm like, that's everything I want to hear as a director. So yeah, I had, you know, you know, he had really had to run a gauntlet of auditions and chemistry tests to get approved by the studio uh, at the time sure. because, you know, again, because nobody had seen anything he had done. So flash forward to, you know, I had a great experience with Henry. We really became close friends from, from simple favor. So when I read the script for last Christmas, I remember thinking, gosh, this is Henry. You know, this is who, this is a Henry that I know in real life. Who's this, this wonderful, upbeat, positive, funny, charming guy. And so really wanted to cast him, but crazy rich Asians hadn't come out yet. And so I kind of had to sort of play a little bit of a game with the, with the studio because they had, you know, more, more famous names at the time that they wanted in the role, which, you know, I was open to, but I, I just couldn't get Henry out of my mind for the role. And so, you know, we kind of looked at other people, but I was always like, oh, okay, let's hold on, hold on, hold on. And then the weekend after Crazy Rich Asians went through the roof, I was like, hey, remember that Henry Golden guy I was talking to you guys about? There? Oh, he's great. Let's hire him. So, so it worked out, nice. uh, you know, and then again, we had another amazing experience just because, I mean, Henry's just a wonderful guy and he's talented. And it was fun doing a movie with him a second time after he had gone away and he did the, then this movie that's not out yet called Monsoon, which is a big, you know, he was like, the, big, the, the leading man in this big independent film and just to see how much he'd been learning and how even more comfortable he was getting on camera and, and just how more confident he was getting with his acting. It, it, it's really been nice to watch the evolution of Henry from the inside. Well, that is very cool. And, uh, I think I'm I'm hooked. I think I'm going to see everything that that guy does. He's amazing. Yeah, I mean he's in he's a uh, he's in Guy Ritchie's new movie called The Gentleman, and I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen clips, and uh, he's great because he plays this really villainous guy, and it's 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 pretty fantastic actually. No, oh, can't wait. Hey, Streetwalkers! Here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. Now, Paul, are you an ordained minister, either on the internet or otherwise? <laughs> yes, uh, via via the internet, uh, it was it was a, a massive amount of training. Basically, I had to write my name and my uh, email address, and then send it off. And suddenly, I was an ordained <laughs> ordained minister, and actually have used my power twice to marry people. So there you go. That is hilarious. I did not know the answer to that question when I asked it, and here's why I asked it. Yes, yeah. when I told my kids who are in their late twenties, I told him that I was going to interview you again. Um, mm. and we were going to talk about last Christmas. I got this question. <clears throat> will you become an ordained minister? And clearly you already are one. And will you officiate a double marriage between my son and Amelia Clark and my daughter <laughs> and Henry Golding? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, I, I, I can do it. I am a man of the digital cloth. And, uh, if I can, <laughs> if I can persuade both, uh, well, Amelia, to uh, get there and, and start dating your son, and then I can get Henry Golding to divorce his wife. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right. I will tell them to hold their breath. So thanks for that. There you, yeah, out. exactly. That's right. You know, it's a land of possibilities. <laughs> so I know that the soundtrack is mostly George Michael songs, and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the title of the picture is actually named after one of his songs. Mm -hmm. How hard was it to get permission from the estate to use all of that music? Like, was that overly hard now, since he's so recently passed? I mean, it's always hard, especially getting that much music. I mean, getting 15 songs that we got. But they were involved kind of from the beginning, too. I mean, honestly, when I came on board, Emma had already, before George had passed away, had talked to him about the movie and told him what she wanted to do and he read a treatment and he loved it and he was just wanted to be involved and really wanted to help with the music and all that you know so we kind of already had that seal of approval from, from him basically and oh, then the, wow. the estate was yeah and then the estate had been involved i mean when i came on board one of the first things that happened was we were flown out to london by the estate to watch this two hour long documentary that George had done about his life. And that's where I would just kind of, you know, because I knew George Michael and I knew all his hits, but I, you know, and, uh, but I didn't really have a deep understanding of, of all the tracks that he had done. Uh, and it was watching this, this 
documentary that just made me go like, oh my God, this has to be the sound for the film. Because, you know, in Emma's script, it, it's based on the song Last Christmas, and it, that's plays through, you know, certain places in the script, and she would put little markers of like, oh, this would be a nice place to hear some George. But that was about it, really. And so we all kind of assumed, well, okay, we'll put like a few songs in. And when we sold it to the studio, they really liked the idea of having songs in there and so wanted us to lock them down. So we, before we go to production, we had to lock down like, five songs that we had definitely had the rights to and so we did that you know and i used some of them when we were actually shooting and all that so the cast could interact with them but then when i got in the post the movie just started begging for more george really these songs just started kind of slipping in very easily and in a way that i i really like i mean i did some of some we've had some critics and reviews that feel that the music is in very randomly, but it, but it's not. I mean, everything was very, very calculated uh, where we wanted to put these various songs, you know, because I didn't want it to be, you know, the lyrics are spot on kind of saying what she's doing, although I do use it for a joke a couple of times where, you know, one time she's just asleep and wake me up before you go, goes on and she bolts away. I just, you know, <laughs> I've, I've got a very dumb sense of humor. And so I just thought that was kind of funny. But then, you know, other things, I, I call it the, basically it's like a soundtrack of your life movie, which is, you know, we established that George Michael is her hero and she's a wannabe singer and all this. So, you know, just like when you have any favorite music in your life, it kind of becomes the soundtrack to your life. You know, if you're in a certain mood, what song do you put on to kind of either make yourself feel better or to play into the emotion that you're feeling? And, you know, so that's really how I faced all these songs. And I'm very, very proud of how we use all the music. And I think, you know, upon multiple viewings, people will start to see exactly why we did what we did. Well, I loved it. Oh, and uh, you briefly mentioned um critics i have read some reviews about different movies recently from mm -hmm. critics yeah. and i am firmly of the opinion that uh we don't need them anymore we're good <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a very interesting thing. I mean, look, I've always had a very nice relationship with critics. You know, my first couple movies just got completely destroyed by the critics, and then my next five actually did really well by the critics. You know, so now to have this one kind of get hit, you know, you know, we were like right around like forty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, which you know is, is low for one of my movies, but it's not in the basement also. But I, I understand the whole thing of critics. I mean, there's so much stuff competing for our time now that we do need somebody to weed it through. My only thing I would say with critics is just in general, if they don't judge it based on what we were clearly going for, it starts to feel a little weird. It, I, and this goes all the way back to when I did a movie called On the Company Miners, which was my first Christmas movie back in 2006. And Lewis Black played my villain. You know, it's a kid's movie. And I remember some of these reviewers being so angry that, like, Lewis Black wasn't able to swear and stuff. And you're like, well, you can't <laughs> knock me for that. It's a kid's movie. So I can't have Lewis Black screaming the F word all the time. So so that, that those are moments I go like, well, okay, now you're not judging us fairly on sort of what we are. You know, and so that's really, I, I just kind of look at it that way. But I, I, I never get mad at the critics. I mean, sometimes what I don't like is, is when suddenly – some critic is kind of a frustrated comedy writer, and so their comedy routine becomes how much they can destroy your movie and their review with you know sort of funny jokes and put downs and snarkiness. Then you're kind of like, all right, you know, this this is a bit of a pile on here, but you got to take the good with the bad. And it, you know, I, I really relish when I get good reviews. So if I do that, then I've got to look at the bad ones. <laughs> but you, it, as you go on and on in your career, you start to care less and less. You know, look, you never want that movie to have bad reviews just be, for the main reason that if it keeps people away from the theater then that's that's a bummer you know because because if if somebody's kept away from something that they you know they would actually like because they read some snarky review then that's sad but you know people eventually always find movies you just want to as a filmmaker you want to make sure that they find when they're in the theaters so that the movie makes money so that then you get to make more movies because if your movies don't make money then you don't get to make movies anymore i i heard that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird, huh? It's such a weird uh, system. That is so weird. Um, I got a little nervous <laughs> with all those sirens that the uh, critic police were coming to get you. Oh, dear. I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in my apartment in New York. It's noisy. <laughs> nice. So I heard that there was a lot of corpsing on the set of this film. Was there? <laughs> 
Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I love you know that term. That's a very British term. I I I, I only learned that sort of uh, over the last few years. You know, for those in your audience who don't know what it means, it means everybody breaking up on set laughing. Yeah, there there was. Emma and Amelia kind of really cracked each other up, and, and uh, there's one scene in particular where Emma's supposed to sing Amelia's character to, to sleep with this really depressing Eastern European uh, lullaby. And it's a dirge. The dirge, I know, and then they just they really couldn't hold it together. But it was I, I love that, and nothing makes me happier than when my cast kind of can't stop laughing. It, it was so funny. So many crew members and stuff get really upset about it, you know, because they just I don't know they feel like time's being wasted and this and that. And I'm always just like, this is hilarious because a they're having a great time. B I know I can put it on the DVD extra and it's going to be really funny and fun to watch. And C it just shows me that they're feeling comfortable enough on a set to be able to. to to do something like that. You know, I, I, I want my sets to be fun. I, I don't want a movie to be a, a drag to work on. I can't work that way. And I don't want my cast to feel that way. So yeah, the more laughing there is, the happier I am. Well, I think that, you know, maybe the, the some of the crew that gets a little angry, maybe they're holed over from the days where, you know, you were shooting on actual film and that was really expensive. And now everything's digital. So it, it's not it's just time and, and not all that money no that i mean that's a, that's a exactly spot on observation yeah you know because when it happens you know you always say something like still rolling and it's like all right calm down it's a, it's, it's you know a computer chip like we've got a million of them it doesn't really matter you know obviously if you're running out of time that's really hard and there's some days where we're just like so behind you know under the gun to kind of finish at a certain time so those are you know occasionally you're like oh god please guys pull it together but then i don't know i still i don't know, i just still really enjoy it well i do too <laughs> now Thank you for talking to me about those two films. I want to tell everybody to go see Last Christmas in theaters right now. And yeah. for those of you who are Amazon Prime members, a simple favor is free on Amazon right now to Prime members. So go oh. check that out, too, if you haven't. I didn't even know that. That's great. Well, you are welcome. <laughs> now, I would like to read you a quote from an amazing actor, and I would like to get your take on it. And Maybe you can tell a story behind it. All right. This is the quote. And if you can't figure out who it is, I'll tell you. But <laughs> I'm sure you'll get it. Yeah. It says, thank you, Paul Feig, for your incredible gift of this beautiful walking stick. Bearing the likeness of my favorite playwright from my favorite film director, I will cherish it. Smiley face with several hearts and exclamation points. Who oh. said it, and why did you give that to them? Oh, good old Tim Albinson. He's the greatest. No, poor Tim, you know, who starred in, um, what was the name of the show? It was a really fun show that was on ABC. It was Psych like a on USA. But what's the other? No, but there's another one he was on that was. Um, oh, uh, Gallivant. Yes, exactly, exactly. He's a lovely guy. I met Tim when I did the very last episode of The Soup. We did like a telethon, kind of a fake telethon, and he was on it. And uh, he was just such a lovely guy and super funny. And we've kind of become friends. And he had a stroke. Like this crazy thing just happened. You know, he's a young guy and had this stroke. And it's really, you know, he's had to go through a lot of therapy and, and to get walking again. And, you know, I collect walking sticks. I collect antique walking sticks and um, just thought, well, he should have a nice stick. You know, if he's going to be trying to walk and trying to rehabilitate himself and, you know, you don't want one of these ugly orthopedic things. You know, so then I had this really, it's actually the first walking stick I ever bought. It like a kind of a this carved, you know, it's made to look like ivory, but it's not clearly. It's in some resin or something, but it's got um, Shakespeare on it and a uh, picture of the old globe and stuff. But it, you know, but it's an actual, it's an actual cane. I collect a lot of walking sticks that are more what they call swagger sticks that you don't, you know, you wouldn't like put all your weight on because it would snap. <laughs> but um, this is one that could actually be used as a cane. And so yeah, send it to Tim, and, and he was just so lovely to to write that back, and and um, I just love him. I think he's, he's He's just a great guy, and then you know, and he's he, you know he's doing much better now. He's just you know he walked the red carpet. That you know that's what it was. What you just quoted for him from a tweet about that. So he's doing great. He's a strong guy, and he's working hard. You know, he's, and he's working away. He's you know he's he's on shows and and, and still working as an actor. And so I, I just admire the admire the hell out of him. And think the world of him. I do too. 
he's a uh, back to work hard because he's on two prime time television shows right now. He's on This Is Us and American Housewife. He might be on others, but those I know he's on as a some regular neighbor guest star or whatever. Yeah. So it's really good to see him back to work. Yeah. And I think it's really cool that you didn't buy it for him. You gave it to him out of your personal collection. That that makes it even cooler that you no. did that. No. You're so cool. Nah, no. you know what? When you, I love nice people. <laughs> when I know nice people, I really want to do nice things for them. Oh, how kind of you to say that about me. Now, yeah. Well, there you go. You're a nice person. There you go. <laughs> so I just have two quick questions before I let you go. Yeah. One, what are, what, are, what are you wearing? <laughs> right now, it's actually embarrassingly, I'm, I'm in a shirt and sweater because I'm holed up in my New York apartment writing, which I usually dress nicer when I write. But for some reason, I'm, I'm kind of down and dirty today as I try to get through this rewrite on this monster movie that I'm doing. Oh, nice. So, oh, a monster movie. Interesting. Yeah. Dot, dot, yeah. dot. Very cool. Exactly. And so that sort of goes into my last question. I know it's a little it's a little gauche to ask, but everybody asks, so I'm going to ask. So what's mm -hmm. next? Well, the monster movie, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I sold this uh, idea to Universal Studios based on, you know, the old classic monster universe that they've had since the 1930s. And they really love the idea. So um, I'm into my second draft right now. They read the first draft and, and loved it. And we're just fixing a few things and trying to, you know, make it as be as good as it can be. And um, that I'm hoping I go into shooting that, you know, next year. Hope I'd love to start prepping this at the beginning of the, of the new year. So see how this rewrite goes. But, um, yeah, I'm very, very excited about it. I love those old, you know, the old James Whale films like... Bride of Frankenstein and the original Frankenstein and, and Invisible Man and all those things and, and you know Todd Browning's um, Dracula. I just love that feel because they were scary and they took the genre very seriously, but they also had fun with it too. And there's like you know it's kind of you know a lot like my movie Simple Favor where you go like okay we're really in the genre, but let's have some fun with it and, and have some laughs along the way just because. It's a genre that is very extreme and over the top sometimes in kind of a, a great way. And I love, you know, I love nothing more than extreme characters set in a real world or at least acting the way they would act for real in this whatever crazy world we put them in. So that's what I'm that's what I'm doing right now. Well, I am looking forward to that, my friend. Thank you. Now, just in case you were looking for ideas, which I'm sure you get pitched things all the time, I think you should do either a movie based on Where is Hattie McDaniel's Oscar? <laughs> because nobody knows where that is. <laughs> I think that'd be a really cool thing. That's the job. Ah, it's it's kind of like na National Treasure or whatever. Yeah, something uh, like that. <laughs> some, some kind of a, a action action movie. I like that. Or even do a biopic of uh, of Gig Young. And for those of you who aren't familiar, look him up. That is a crazy story. Yeah, yeah. It's a good one. Now, Paul Feig, thank you so much for taking the time again out of your clearly busy day. My pleasure. To hang out again and let us get to know you a little bit even better on Fascination Street. It is always a pleasure to talk to you, and um, I'm so happy to get to do it again. Sweet. Well, until next time, sir. And remember, everybody, go check out Last Christmas Scene Theaters right now and go check out A Simple Favor on Amazon Prime for free for Prime members right now. There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. You have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Steve. You too. Great to talk to you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. This is an iTunes review for Fascination Street Podcast. This one is from Sean Fabulous. She sounds hot. It says, Prepare to be charmed. A lovely collection of stories about fascinating humans. Every person has a story, and this guy will bring it to you with humor and charm. Thanks, Sean Fabulous. That was a five-star iTunes review for Fascination Street Podcast. Rate and review Fascination Street Podcast on iTunes, and maybe next week I'll read your review.
As always, thanks for listening, Streetwalkers. And don't forget, follow the show on Twitter at FascinationSTPD, on Instagram at Fascination Street Pod. Follow the podcast page on Facebook at Fascination Street Podcast. And of course, you can always email me at FascinationStreetPod at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and rate us on iTunes. For the next three months, everybody who rates and reviews the show and sends a screenshot to fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com will get a free surprise gift mailed to them, every single one of you. So do it. Thanks, Streetwalkers. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street. Thank you.